Thanks and good afternoon, everybody. In the uh, in the infamous post-lunch hole, which I, I hope is a good thing. And if there's a topic that ought to wake everybody up post-lunch, I think it's demystifying due diligence. Uh, that is topic, and let me walk through a little preamble to kind of set stage with you all. Um, we basically want to look at sort of the mystery around the diligence process for any of you you who've been on the road and trying to figure out um, what the Invesco's and the uh, Wilshire's, et cetera, of the world are doing as they take all of this data from you. Uh, we're hopefully going to shed a bit of light on that. Uh, so we'll dig into a handful of issues, including basic diligence and how these folks go about it. Uh, talk about what are catalysts to, to deals getting killed and killed early. Uh, we may delve into the art of referencing, which seems to have become um, a, a very important part, time 60, 70, 80, 100 references per fund that we've been involved in. We'll touch a little bit on decision making, too, since it ultimately is part of the whole due diligence process. So that's the topic. Um, the speakers, uh, to give a little bit of introduction and background, working uh, my, my left across the right, I'm going to let you read their backgrounds. I suspect this is a group of folks whose organizations are quite well known. I think each of them individually is, is well known on the fundraising trail as well. Uh, but just by way of introduction, uh, Christine Brandt, who's a director with Invesco, uh, and I think is a good example of representing all kinds of LPs in the Invesco platform, which will help give us, uh, I think, a great cross-section perspective of how different LPs under the Invesco banner evaluate funds and do due diligence. Uh, to Christine's left is Carl Beinkampen. Uh, Carl is CIO of Wilshire Private Markets. And again, I think the underlying investors within the in the platform there give a nice different kind of view and perspective on how decisions are made, how due diligence is pulled apart to get to the right GPs. Uh, to Carl's left is David Landau. You'll learn very quick, quickly that David is not from Texas, uh, <laughs> not from New York either, right. and I'll let him shed some light on that in a moment. Uh, David runs private equity for the YMCA Retirement Fund, I think a group that we're all familiar with, certainly by maybe uh, early workout days and some of the things we did in communities, but uh, you ought to know that they've been an active private equity investor, and so David will bring a good, uh, I think, 10-plus year perspective on his views of sifting through funds and trying to figure out which are the right ones. Uh, last but not least, and I think Steve gets the, uh, the Wisdom Award, if I read bios right, uh, close to a 30-year career, in spite of only being, what, 39? <laughs> yeah, <I wish. laughs> in various aspects of uh, private equity, looking at everything from primaries to directs and co-invests and secondaries, doing a lot of fundraising. I think I met, first met Steve in Harrisburg about a thousand years yeah, ago right. when he was with the state of Pennsylvania yeah. and uh, sort of learning the ropes of private equity from a public funds perspective. Since we're demystifying, I thought uh, it might be useful to have the panelists run through one by one and just share something that demystifies each of them, something that's a fun fact that you're not going to read in a bio. And Christine, I'll kick off with that before we jump into questions. Well, one thing that's probably not in my bio, I'm, um, I was born in British Columbia, so I'm Canadian. And I was a ski bomb in Jackson Hole for five years. Good. Well, I did with ski. I, I did not know any of that. <laughs> that's knowledge yeah. learned. And, and, and I would um, encourage everybody to do that sometime in their life. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Carl? Uh, well, I, I actually I call uh, <laughs> Delaware home. Uh, which is not in and of itself uh, particularly unique, although if there's anyone basically within five years of my age, I probably know them uh, quite well and might have dated them. Um, <laughs> but I think the interesting thing is, while Delaware is always, I consider my home, I actually did spend some very formative years growing up in Tehran, Iran, wow, and I've cool. uh, watched what's been happening there over the last um, several decades with a lot of interest and, uh, and curiosity to see how, how that uh, all turns out. Good. David? Yeah, as Tripp said, I'm not a native New Yorker, as you can tell. I, am, I was born in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And uh, I was the captain of a high school cricket team, a sport that most Americans find utterly, utterly and totally incomprehensible. <laughs> All right, Steve, pressure. Uh, everything uh, that I could think of was ultimately embarrassing, so I had to pick the least embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, during my days at Duquesne University, uh, I was a uh, male cheerleader for the basketball team. Now, mind wow. you, I did play football. I played football, <laughs> but uh, I was a male cheerleader for the basketball team. Can we chat about that after, <laughs> that after the panel? <laughs> no. Wow. I hope all of you are recording all of those fun facts, <laughs> and uh, feel free to ask questions about more of those if due diligence gets boring. So to, so to dig into the topic format-wise, we'll do this the same way other panels have with a kind of a roundtable Q&A. I would encourage folks to answer, ask questions, interrupt. Let's make this free form. We now only have uh, 27 minutes left to get this done. So we'll, uh, we'll jump in. Before I do that, show of hands. GPs in the room, so we know who we're talking to. So about a third. LPs in the room. So we would expect you to offer your perspectives if you want to add on. And how about uh, that leaves everybody else as a placement firm, a accounting firm, or something else that is serving this august industry. Good. So we know who we're speaking to. So Steve, I'm going to start uh, with you since we left you to the, uh, the end of the fun fact line. Yeah. Before we get into due diligence, you have to get the PPM sort of off your desk or out of your inbox, um, and somebody has to do something with it. Talk a little bit about uh, what's going on with Pinebridge. Do you guys take all comers, or is there a process, something that gets you really interested in an offering that automatically puts it into the, right. we need to go deal with this pile? Right. Uh, I think it, you have to be cognizant of uh, who you're approaching with your PPMs and understand what their mandates are. So our mandate is uh, uh, strictly for equity, uh, small mid-market growth, U.S., Europe, Asia, Latin America, and then credit opportunities uh, with managers that generate yield. So 70 to 80 percent of your total return has to come from the yield component. And so that's the first pass. And then I think generally, if I could offer any starting advice for when that PPM hits that uh, potential investor's desk, uh, I, I think of always two things. One, when they read the PPM, uh, they're looking for reasons not to do you, right? They'll get to the reasons to do you later. But when they first read that PPM, because they're, they have a plethora of opportunities, they're, you know, uh, every day we get 10 or 20 offerings. So they're looking for reasons not to do it. And they can put it on the pile. And then uh, as they're reading it, they're not actually listening or, or reading what you say. What they're looking for is what you don't say that you should have said. It, because as they're reading through, they say, well, I'm looking at this and, and I hear what they're, I, I see what they wrote, but you know, it seems like they should be saying something else or there's a piece missing here. That's what that really helps them tune in. That, that's what they're looking. They're looking for what you should have say that you didn't say. And if they find a lot of those, that's not a great way to start your due diligence process. <clears throat> Fair enough. David or Carl, you have some additional comment? Well, I think one of the takeaways the group's going to find is that LPs are very diverse. And, um, you know, all of us have limited time and have limited resources. Um, at the YMCA, you're pretty much looking at our private equity team. It's one person <laughs> myself. So therefore, I cannot, I don't have the luxury of the time or the staff to sort of field all comers and to look at you know, just about every PPM. So instead, I go the other way. I become much more proactive in whose PPMs I want to see and I'm interested in rather than going the other way. Now, having said that, obviously we all get dealt with by placement agents and, and our own networks and uh, areas that we may be light on and want to attract. So when a PPM comes into me, let's say it's a firm, I've just only assume I've only heard the name and not much beyond that, but it's in at least a sector in which I might have an interest. I think the executive summary up front is very, very important because that, that's your one shot. You know, just as you have a first impression when you see the people physically, it's that executive summary that's also um, very important. And sometimes, you know, they, they say a picture sells is worth a thousand words. Sometimes in an introduction, in a summary, you can just get it. A couple of groups just really put in a good graphic. It could be a pie chart. It could be, a, a, you know, a, a geographical map. But you get it very quick and say, this is who they are. That then helps me assess, does this particular general partner add to, complement, or detract from what I already have in my portfolio? So that's the initial step that, for me, is very helpful. Good. Yeah. Carl, did you have something to add I to would, that? I would add to David's point. I think if, if, the, if the initial point of introduction is the PPM, 
um, I, I think that is a challenge for, for someone raising a fund. I think organizations like, I think like David's and very much like ours that are very research focused, we start with a top-down thesis and we start with a broad sort of concept of what a portfolio architecture is right. going to look like. Yeah. And we proactively try to find opportunities that fit our criteria. Uh, in most cases, the PPM is something that arrives after several years of, of having known a, known a GP just through casual conversations, and, and, and I know this is true for Christine as well, uh, for, for you know uh, interactions over time. So I think that I think I actually think the key is not to focus as much on the PPM, but on building the relationship before the PPM hits anyone's desk. Yes. <coughs> Absolutely, Christine. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, one thing that I would add is know your audience. And so know who you're speaking to and what they want. And that goes back to Stephen's point about um, you know, whether or not they're going to be engaged. And so exactly, the PPM is probably the third thing that we look at. We want to see a nice, concise overview. We want to see the strategy. We want to see the returns. And put those up front. Don't try to hide them back somewhere. Good. <laughs> Christine, keep the stage and shift a little bit so <clears throat> whatever the means a fund is in-house and you're serious about it, what, what are the sort of three, four key areas in a phase one diligence that you are really trying to get your arms around and, and in what order of importance if you'd shed light on priority? Sure. Um, well, number one is the ability of the team to stick together. We need to be convinced that the team is going to be together for 10 years or 12 years, 13 years. Number two is that the returns that you show in your track record are due to the people that are still around the table. And are they also um, still going to be working as hard to find deals and get those returns um, when we as an LP are investing? Um, number three, I would say, you know, transparency. We really need information and we don't want to have to go dig for it. Um, and it only inures to the benefit of the GP if they're as transparent as possible because that shows up, us that they have nothing to hide, that, you know, they're putting it all out on the table and it's a relationship and um, that's what we're going to see going forward. Because we have to, you know, we have, when we're doing due diligence, we have to think about the long-term relationship that we're going to have with GPs. And so that initial meeting and that initial way in which they present their, their um, data is very important to us. Mm -hmm. Good. Anybody else? I'd sort of free form. Anybody else have any comments to make there? David? Well, you know, my little recipe, if you will, is uh, the integrity of the people the integrity of the performance and the integrity of the strategy, and which to me are fundamental. And I think uh, they all go, you know, they're equally important and they all knit together very well. So when, sure. when, when the team comes in for the first time, assuming it's just a introductory meeting, to me one of the, the, the very subtle and yet important things I'm looking for is to try to ev just evaluate the chemistry and the style of the people in the room. Because very often every uh, firm is different. There are some, everybody say we're a partnership, we collegial. That, that's easy to say that. You have to demonstrate that. And sometimes there are firms that are clearly dominated by one individual, which may also be fine if that's an exceptionally talented individual, but you try to evaluate that dynamic amongst the team. And then as Christine correctly said, it very quickly flows through. Have they stuck together? You know, are they all sort of clustered around the same age? Is, is there a gap? You know, you, ideally you like to see senior, middle and junior ages and levels uh, in the room, but that you, you can just visually see that and feel that within the first uh, five minutes. And then finally, the, the, the strategy, it's important to me to see to what extent it's been consistent over time, because very often as funds get bigger or as opportunities come and go, you, you run into the problems of strategy drift, and it doesn't always work. Right. So that, that to me is also very important. If they have a consistent strategy, can it be replicable in the future? So and then naturally the numbers will knit in together with those. Sure, if you don't have a consistent strategy, describe why well, you decided to go. Absolutely. Anyway. Because well we're seeing that a lot. Well these said. Days. Yeah. 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 Any, uh, just a reminder, any questions anybody wants to chime in with from the audience? Otherwise, we'll keep plowing. Um, maybe shift down into quantitative versus qualitative. 
Um, I've heard uh, some of the comments you've just made describe some of the qualitative, very important but qualitative assessments of team, of strategy. As you all get deeper into interest in a fund and are really trying to evaluate the qualitative side of the funds versus the quantitative, I guess the question starts with, does one side carry more weight, quant versus qualitative? A lot of GPs are under the impression that we work with that it's all about track record. And if you're not putting up good multiples, solid IRRs, lots of cash back from the last couple of funds, that it's awfully difficult to get the attention of an LP. So quantitative versus qualitative. Carl, maybe you sure. start off. Sure. It's interesting because I've had the chance to, to, to consider this from two different perspectives, two different firms that I've worked for over time. And I'd say the firm that I'm with right now, Wilshire, really has a deep legacy in quantitative analysis. And I was actually surprised when I arrived there uh, several years ago how deep and how much quantitative work was done around track record and performance to simulate uh, performance going forward, uh, a lot of detail uh, around individual company buildup and performance, uh, as well as some pretty detailed work around risk budgeting uh, from a portfolio perspective. Um, I, I take the view that, that, that those quantitative uh, exercises are really, because we're talking about a long-term prospective ability to outperform the market significantly, those are really tools to begin to think about what are the fundamental drivers that allow a manager to do what is arguably a, a very difficult task, which is to, to, to achieve those types of returns. So I really look at those as a, as a very powerful tool in helping you get to understand what drives performance. Uh, but I don't think that uh, that we would we would put numbers in, into a model and look at a, a black box output and say, well, yep. clearly this is an organization that, that deserves uh, that deserves additional capital. Yep. David, you have a well. My, my only comment is it goes back to my previous comment. To me, the three fundamentals is it's the people, it's the performance, it's the strategy. The quantitative element come, for me comes into that performance element, but it's one of three. It's not the, the only arbiter. Now that's where it becomes very often a, a resource issue because ideally what you try to do either internally or you outsource it is to do as much attribution as you possibly can and say, you know, well, just as you, as, you know, as Christine said, who are the good deals, who are the bad deals, who were responsible for the ones that worked, who were the responsible for the ones that didn't, are they still there today? That sort of digging in. Um, is where the uh, quantitative piece is helpful. Now, if you are challenged for time, you know, we will on occasion, especially internationally, use fund of funds outside of the U.S. because mm. they can do that sure. on, on our behalf. So, and they will have the staff and the resources to really go, you know, company by company, person by person to do the attribution that I cannot do as easily sure. outside the U.S. than I can internally. Sure. Christine, you look like you had a point well, to make. Well, one interesting thing is I think if you asked me this same question 12 years ago, I would have said it's 50-50. Now I think the quantitative is probably more like 35 or 40 hmm. percent. In, in, or, or Sorry, the quantitative is, is that amount and the qualitative is the rest. And the reason being that um, we need groups that are going to work together and are going to stay together. And it's interesting, I had, a, I had a meeting with a GP the other day and he, he was talking about studies that have been done recently that have said that there's a very high correlation between brilliant people going to brilliant schools becoming doctors. There's a very high correlation between brilliant people going to brilliant schools becoming lawyers. But there is not that correlation. It's almost an inverse correlation between brilliant people going to brilliant schools and becoming asset managers. <laughs> so that brings in um, the qualitative notion that we have to we have to get under, and um, so that's why at this point I think that it's more important. So it's a balance, a very val balanced perspective that you take. It's very sure. balanced, and I would I would say to you all, one of the things that we want to do when we're doing our qu quantitative analysis, it is important. I'm not. I'm not trying to diminish that, but we want to do it ourselves. So we just want the raw data and so that we can do the cash flows, so that we can do the TVPI, DPI, um, IRR, et cetera. Um, that's what we prefer to, to do. Sure. Maybe move a step farther down the line of diligence is moving along, done. It's time to get in front of your peer investment committee members. Steve, maybe take the, the IC door shuts, you're in talking about three or four funds that you've been vetting. 
talk about that conversation, and I want to get all of you chiming in because I suspect everything, everybody's a little bit different. But Steve, maybe kick that off and talk about that environment. What kinds of questions are asked? What are you presenting at that level to get to a decision? Well, I think every uh, investment committee, depending on uh, the the investor, is going to be a little bit different, and they have different points of view. Uh, generally, with our investment committees, uh, and we have a two tier. We have it amongst the partners, and then we have one at the firm level. Uh, you know, amongst the partners, uh, it really is about uh, is this additional uh, investment accretive to the overall goal in which we're trying to uh, uh, get to? Uh, is the, it's not so much the returns that they have, but it's the quality of the returns, sort of like a quality of earnings uh, type of aspect. Is it, is it repeatable? And so the partners uh, in the group when we're at these ICs are looking both at the quantitative and determining if because we know quantitative is rear view mirror, right? it's, it's in the rear view mirror. Qualitative is prospective, and I think most of the partners uh, amongst the group is, is concerned about the prospective qualitative aspect actually more than the quantitative, because the quantitative gets you in the door, gets the discussion started. It's the qualitative, the prospective part that the partners in the IC uh, is interested in. And then at the, uh, the firm level IC, um, essentially what, what they're most concerned about uh, is reputational risk and pure qualitative. Will the team stay together? Uh, are we going to be embarrassed that somehow the underwriting didn't pick up that there was a problem uh, with the team ultimately breaking apart or being suboptimal? So it really is a, it's a two-tier process for us as we go through to make a final determination. Let's jump around a little bit at this. Carl, I know in our prep this is one of the questions you tossed out, so you probably have a perspective. Sure. I, I think as I've sort of thought about the investment decision process, and obviously we think about this a lot because it's kind of what we do for a living, I've kind of come to the conclusion that there are basically two models that, um, that investment organizations use. One is sort of the, the, the vote uh, strong leader uh, model. The other is much more of a consensus building, you know, reaching across the organization to get best ideas. Um, obviously from the way I describe them, I'm a, I'm a fan of the latter. And I've actually tried to promote that in the organizations where I've had a, had, a, had the chance to serve on those investment committees. Um, I think the key in, in, in both in both uh, both of those situations is is to not have that have the impression that there's a steel door that closes and then a decision comes out of it uh, later. I think the key is to make sure that the entire organization is very much engaged in the in the decision making process, and that you're bringing the best ideas or the best perspectives from a very broad and experienced team to that investment decision process as it advances down the path. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of uh, behavioral um, psychology, I think, that, that you need to take into consideration when, when these decisions are being made and as the, as the, as the process advances. Um, so I think, I think from the perspective of a GP trying to present an opportunity, I think it's key to make sure that you are engaged as much as you can in every step so that by the time it gets to that door closing, uh, there's much less risk from, from your perspective of, of, of an out, uh, uncertain outcome. Yep. Okay. Fair enough. David? Well, I'll show you how our investment committee uh, works. Firstly, uh, we are very fortunate because the members on our investment committee are all volunteers, so there's no vested interest whatsoever uh, to start with. And secondly, each and every one of them are in, you know, have had a career in the investment field. And by choice, there will always be at least one member of the executive committee uh, on the, who knows, you know, like in my case, private equity. We'll also have a member who will know real estate, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the way that it works is that we only have one opportunity in the ring with them, and it's done uh, via a conference call, which is very tricky because people are located across uh, the United States in different time zones. So, and we only we, we, a meeting should not last longer than 30 minutes. So we really only have a you know literally a short period of time. It's done over a telephone to really make the case and to deal with the uh, the issues that they raise. So to me, that's the most stressful part of the job because we don't get their buy-in early along the way. There are some investment committees, you know, who will do it in two or three or four steps. So by the time the final investment committee comes, it's very much a done deal. With in my case, it's very stressful. It's like literally being back at university doing an oral exam. It's exactly <laughs> that. It's exactly that process. So the the technique that that has worked um, for me is that um, I try to, in the write-up, be totally upfront with all the obvious blemishes, concerns, risks, etc., to put them up front and to already address them in the write-up. If I've done that well enough, then hopefully 
the majority of the questions that I'm going to then be asked are more what I would call friendly informational questions. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? That's great. I love sure. those sort of questions <laughs> that that one can handle. The second, but the more stressful one we always have to watch out for is what I call newspaper headline risk. Often just two or three days before the meeting, something will hit the paper, uh, you know, another negative article on Europe or whatever it might be, and you have to address that. Right, right. Uh, interesting and, and different from the others. Yeah. Sure. Christine, how about any wisdom from you? Um, well, we have a very iterative process, so we like to develop long-term relationships with any group, regardless of whether or not we're going to decide to invest or we're going to pass on fund two, fund three, whatever. Um, so it, it, it's more about asking questions among our team. And if those questions are answered in a positive way, then we move forward. If there's something that stumps a few of us and we can't answer it in a positive way in terms of why this firm should be part of our portfolio, then it, it kind of goes by the wayside. Um, but having said that, uh, it, for us, it's, it's about relationships. We, even though we turn a firm down, we still want to talk to them and we still want to hear how they're doing and know how they're doing. And that only um, helps us and I hope it helps the, the firms that we're looking at too. Sure, good, good cross section. Last call for questions. We have one, uh, two, do I hear two? Joan? You stand up. So the question is about how we convey the information to the manager if we're going to turn them down, given the fact that we would like to maintain a long-term relationship. And um, we are as honest as possible because we realize that if we're maintaining a long-term relationship, it has to be built on trust. And so we're willing to give feedback in terms of, okay, perhaps it doesn't fit in our portfolio right now. We have five early stage venture capital firms and so we can't fit another one in there. Or um, you need to work on your returns. Um, you're telling us that um, your TVPI is 10.0 but your DPI is 0, you know, 0.8 or, or something like that. So, um, so that, that's how we look at it. But we try to be as honest as possible and whenever I speak with a group, and I think that this goes for my whole team, whenever we speak with a group that's compelling enough to go through the due diligence process, we, we don't want to throw that away. We want to de develop that relationship, and we would like to hear how they're doing going forward. Good. Maybe the other question in the interest yeah, of time. I know we got it. Um, do, do you invest in um, due diligence processes with regards to when you're looking at all these companies and the relationships you have? like? looking at integrity related issues, things like that, you know, where you might bring in a third party that would look at the people and the um, companies that you might be. I Are you asking about, about background, background checks? checks yeah, I know that there are a lot of groups doing that. We we don't, um, only because we think that our due diligence is, is really good, <laughs> and so we prefer to do it ourselves rather than outsourcing anything like that. But um, uh, but I do think it's important we use background checks because, look, I mean, we don't want to know, uh, you know, everything, but we want to know, look, if the guy's going through uh, a divorce and he has four houses and he has his own personal financial issues that would never come through in a normal due diligence process of looking at the fund, we want to be aware of that. So if there are things that we can gather through a a fact finder or background checks that would be relevant to that person's uh, mindset. We want to be cognizant of that. Yeah, we, we use we we typically have a third party uh, resource as well, and not only does it give you information to think about about things you might not have access to otherwise by asking the question. In fact, a few years ago, I asked a GP. I, I said, you know, we're going to be running a background check on you. Um, is there anything that you'd like to tell me that might come up in that background check? And he stopped for a moment and he looked at me. He said. Does, does that go back to college? <laughs> <laughs> so. Did you inhale? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Any other questions from the audience? Maybe one more or not? We're good. I think we've, uh, we've officially reached end of time, so do we get points for finishing on time? I want to thank everybody on the panel. Uh, hopefully this has given you a little bit of a bird's eye view into how these decisions get made and what the issues are. Let's have a round of applause for them. Well done. Good to see you. Okay, good to see you.